Hi, I'm Dan Cordopassi. Welcome to Model Building. In this series, I'm working to recreate five locomotives that I saw in the front of a Southern Pacific freight train in 1993 in HO scale. In the last episode, I worked on the two SP SD45Rs and the Conrail SD40, prepping the shells for replacement fans and adding a few details. My goal this time is to continue the detailing of the long hoods of the two SD45Rs and the B30-7. Specifically, my goals for this episode are to remodel 7482's brake wheel area, I want to add rear light clusters to all the SP and cotton belt units, and I want to complete the detailing on the ends of the long hoods on those same models. As I was working on the two SD45 shells, I noticed that the Proto 2000 shell that I'm using for SP7479 has a better brake recess than the Kato shell I'm using for 7482. The recess on the Proto shell has more depth and looks more like the real thing, while the recess on the Kato shell is very shallow. Before I start adding more fragile parts, I want to do some surgery on 7482 to correct this. I want to cut out the interior of the brake recess while leaving the rest of the shell intact, so I have to be very careful here. I'll start by drilling a series of holes. For this next step, I'll use my Zuron sprue cutters. These are specifically made to cut plastic. I'm careful not to use them on anything else because it'll ruin the blades. I'll use the sprue cutters and the plastic in between the holes. Now I can whittle away most of the remaining plastic with my X-Acto knife. It's important to go slowly here and cut little bits at a time, and be careful not to use too much force. If the knife slips, it can make for a nasty cut, and it might also damage the shell. Once I have most of the brake recess cleared, I can switch to files and sandpaper to clean up the edges. I'll use a coarser file first, and follow it up with a finer file. I'll also give the edges a light sanding with some 400 grit sandpaper, just for good measure. Before I'm done, I'll use a file to clean up the back of the opening inside the shell. I want a nice flat surface in there. I'll check carefully to make sure that the edges are all straight and free of excess plastic before calling it done. Looks like it's pretty good. Before I start building the new brake wheel recess, I need to check clearances. I've put the shell back on the chassis temporarily. I'm looking at how much room I have between the brake wheel area and the gear tower on the rear truck as the truck swings. It looks like I'll have to make sure that whatever I do doesn't project more than about 40 thousandths beyond the edge of the opening that I cut. What I want to do is approximate what's on the Proto 2000 shell while making sure that the new parts don't interfere with the operation of the rear truck. For me, this is one of those areas where operation takes precedence over looks, and it's important that the rear truck can swing freely. I'm going to start with some evergreen strip styrene. I had some of this HO scale 6x10 stock on hand, which measures 066 x 112 I don't know if these are the correct dimensions as far as the actual depth on the real engine. I'm just doing this by eye and these pieces look about right to me. I'm cutting two five scale foot long pieces. The exact length isn't really important, it just has to be slightly taller than the brake recess opening. Each piece needs a light sanding on one side, as the strip styrene has some cut marks on the sides as it comes out of the package. Now I can glue these pieces inside the shell with the sanded side facing the opening. I'll tack glue them with liquid styrene cement. Most of the time I use same stuff from Micromark, but other brands will also work. Tack gluing allows me some time to adjust their positions. I want to make sure that the edges are flush with the narrow part of the recess near the bottom and that they're straight up and down. Once I'm satisfied everything is in the right place, I can add some more glue. Next, I need to cut some filler pieces for the top and bottom. Just like in the last episode, I thought of a better way to do something as I was working. I'll sand the cut marks first, then cut more pieces to length. These are about 18 scale inches long. I'll cut them and file them down until they fit. I'll glue the top piece in first since it's harder to get in there. To make sure that the edges are flush with the opening, I push them with the flat of my X-Acto blade before final gluing. I'll use a little squadron green putty on the bottom of the opening just to make sure that the seam doesn't show. Once the putty's dry, I'll give it a sanding with some 400 grit sandpaper. Sometimes it helps to get into tight places to improvise a sanding block, in this case from some strip styrene and a piece of 400 grit paper. The next step is to construct the brake wheel housing. Fortunately, it's a pretty simple shape, basically a rectangle with a rounded end. I'll use the Proto 2000 shell as a guide to get a measurement. It looks like the housing is about 15 scale inches wide. To make the housing, I'll use some 060 styrene sheet. I'll measure a scale 15 inches and make a mark with my X-Acto knife. Then I'll do the same in another spot. I'll line up the ruler on both marks and start scribing the styrene. Once the groove is deep enough, I can snap it off. 
Now I can compare the piece I cut to the housing on the proto shell. It looks close, maybe a hair too wide, but it still needs to be sanded, so it should be okay. I'll use a piece of 400 grit sandpaper on plate glass to sand the piece down. I keep working it until the width looks right. Next I'll use a file to round off one end. I'm trying to match the curvature on the Proto 2000 part. Much of this will end up behind the brake wheel anyway, so if it's slightly off, chances are no one will notice, but I'd still like it to look as good as possible. Once I'm satisfied with the shape, I can cut the piece to length, again using the Proto 2000 part as a guide. My piece ended up slightly too long, so I'll cut it down to its final size with a file. Now that it's the right size, I can drill a hole for the brake wheel axle with a number 76 drill bit. It looks like the brake chain is about a scale 9 inches from the right side of the brake wheel housing on the Proto model. I'll measure the same distance on my fabricated part and mark it with a pencil. The next part is a little tricky. Holding the housing upside down but centered in the brake wheel opening, I'll make a corresponding mark on the shell. Using the edge of a small jeweler's file, I'll cut a groove in the back of the brake wheel housing to accommodate a chain. Note that the groove only extends part way up the part. It shouldn't go all the way to the top. Next, I need to cut a corresponding groove on the shell. Trying to use the mark I made was making me nervous that I get it in the wrong place, so I came up with another idea. I set the shell on my work table and positioned the housing centered side to side in the opening. Now I can just put the file over the groove in the housing and start filing the shell. The notch only needs to be deep enough for the small chain I'll be using. In this case, I did cut the groove from top to bottom. Before I get to the chain itself, I need to make a backing piece for the brake wheel housing. I already know that the pieces of plastic I cut for the vertical edges are 5 scale feet long. Using my scale rule, the width is approximately 3 scale feet. I'll use some O30 styrene to make the part. This is just thick enough to be rigid, but hopefully thin enough not to cause issues with clearance. It's okay if the size isn't a perfect match here. Most of this will be inside the shell. I'll cut a piece 3 scale feet wide by 5 scale feet long. After cutting, I'll give the edges a light sanding to knock down any ridges left by the cutting process. On the Proto 2000 shell, the bottom of the brake wheel housing is 18 scale inches from the bottom of the shell and slightly below the bottom of the notches where the recess gets wider. I'll position my housing on the backing piece 18 inches from the bottom and centered. Once I'm satisfied with the position, I'll glue it down with liquid styrene cement. This is a tiny piece of 40 link per inch chain from my scrap box. Chain like this is sold by a variety of model manufacturers. I think this one was from Builders and Scale. If you can't find it in the train department, they also sell stuff like this for model ships. For the next step, I'm using Zap Thin CA glue and some needle nose pliers. This is another tricky operation. I'm going to dip the end of the chain in the CA glue, then lower it into the hole in the bottom of the housing. Hey, it worked. Next, I'll use a short length of scrap wire as an applicator to glue down the rest of the chain, making sure it hangs straight down. Now I can use my Zuron flush cutters to remove the excess chain. Any extra CA can be cleaned off the plate glass surface pretty easily. If it dries, just use a knife or razor blade to scrape it off. I got a small amount of excess glue on the part, so I'll carefully sand it down with some 400 grit paper. To prep the piece for the next step, I'll stick it to some blue painter's tape. I'll spray the part with some testers gloss coat, a clear gloss paint. The clear gloss will help decals to adhere. Putting decals on bare plastic usually doesn't work very well. On the Proto 2000 brake housing, there are three rivets in a triangular pattern near the bottom. I'm going to use Archer Rivet Decal Sheet 88026 to add this detail to my new part. When applying decals, I use Microscale's Microset and Microsol. Microset goes on first, followed by the decal, then Microsol on top. The rivets come in rows on the decal sheet. Since I only need individual rivets, I'll cut out three of them with my X-Acto knife. To apply the decals, I'll also need some water in a small bowl and a soft brush. The archer rivets tend to come off the decal sheet very quickly once they're wet, so I'll need to be careful I don't lose them. I'm using my X-Acto knife to stab the decal paper so it stays put. Next, I'll use some water to get it wet. Now I'll brush a little microset on the area where the decal will go. I needed a second tool to prod the decal off the backing sheet and the screwdriver was handy. While the decal is still wet, I can position it where I want it. Once again, I'm using the Proto 2000 part as a reference. 
After the decals have dried, I can put a little Microsol on top to help them stick. For the first application of Microsol, it's important to use a light touch so that the decals don't move. I can always use more later if I need to. So let's see how it looks mocked up together. I think it turned out pretty good. Because it'll be easier to paint the brake housing assembly separate from the shell, I'm going to leave this part off for now. I'll attach this part in the brake wheel during final assembly. I'll put the newly fabricated part into 7482's project box for safekeeping. The last thing is to recheck clearances. It looks like the gear tower is just touching the edge of the forwardmost piece of plastic I glued into the shell. I'll probably need to remove a small amount of material from this area. I'll save that step for later during final assembly. Unfortunately, I don't have any plans or scale drawings with the dimensions of the light boxes on the rear of SPB 30-7s. When I need to make a part but don't have exact dimensions, I can do a few things to estimate the size. I can use known dimensions. For example, in this photo I can see that the width and height of the light box are the same as the blank cover plate. I can also use features on the model. For example, the bottom of the box is just slightly above the rear headlight and number boards. The main thing is that the finished part should look right. In HS scale, if it ends up being off by one scale inch, most likely no one's going to notice. But if it's off by six inches, then it'll probably look wrong. I have a few sets of BLMA blanked out light covers left over from previous projects, so I'm going to use the one that looks closest to what's on the real engine. If you wanted to backdate the engine and the model with its lights still on, you could use an oscillating headlight casting for dimensions. The part is one quarter of an inch wide. I'm using real world dimensions to measure as the part aligns with the tick marks on the ruler better than using HO scale feet. This might seem odd, but the part is two N scale feet tall. Again, I'm using whichever part of the ruler lines up best with the part. How much is that in HO scale feet? For my purposes here, it doesn't really matter. What I need are dimensions that I can easily reproduce when I start cutting plastic. Alternatively, I could skip measuring and just use the part itself as my cutting guide. I'll remove the cover plate from the fret using the thick end of an X-Acto blade on a plate glass cutting surface. Next, I'll clean up the edges with a flat file, being careful to keep the file in line with the part so that I don't bend it. I'll also file the back, which will help the glue adhere better. I don't have any styrene thick enough for the entire depth of the box, so I'll need to laminate several pieces together. I'm guesstimating that the depth of the box front to back is about a scale foot. I have some HO scale 4x12 strip styrene on hand, so I'll use that. It turns out that four of these stacked together are the same height as the cover plate. Before I start putting all that together, I want to figure out the mounting plate for the emergency light. Even though I'm not going to use the lights on this model, I found some details west 115 pile gyrolite castings in my parts box. I'll use this one as a guide for the dimensions of the mounting plate. Since the mounting plate is so thin, I'm going to fabricate it out of sheet brass. I'm hoping this will hold up better than plastic. I'm using this beat up piece of 10,000 sheet brass that I've had since I was probably 12 or 13 years old. You might notice evidence of an early attempt to scratch build a shell for SP4449 in N scale. That project didn't get far, but I learned a lot by trying stuff like that. I found a spot on the sheet that has a straight edge. I'm using the gyrolite casting plus one of the 4x12 pieces of styrene to get the height for the part that I'm going to make. I cut thin brass the same way I cut styrene, by scoring it with an X-Acto blade. This will make the blade dull in a hurry, but it works. After several passes, I use something to hold the piece I want securely, then flex the rest to break it. Now I have a strip of sheet brass. The emergency light mounting plate has a back piece and two wings that partially surround the back of the light. The wings need to be about the same depth as the box that it sits on top of, so I'm using one of the pieces of plastic that I'm using to make the box as a guide to score the strip on one side. I'll use the light casting to determine the width of the middle piece. Then I can use my strip of plastic to get the width of the outer wing. I'm using some smooth jawed needle nose pliers to hold the brass while I flex it. The smooth jaws won't leave imprints in the brass. It looks like I got one of the wings slightly longer than the other, so I'll carefully file it down. The wings start to taper from the front of the box toward the back, just a little above the point where the mounting plate joins the box. I'm using my strip of styrene again to account for the thickness of one layer plus a little bit. Now I'll score the brass lightly to mark it. The piece now has two vertical lines and one horizontal line. I'll cut two diagonal pieces from the corners using the scribed lines as a guide. Now the part looks like this. This is a set of headlight covers from KV models. I'm not going to use these right now either, but I want to copy the bolt pattern from the gyrolite cover to my part. The real mounting plates had holes where the bolts used to be. If you're going to model the engine with the lights still on it, you could skip the bolt holes. I've put some pieces of blue painter's tape on my plate glass to hold the part steady. I very carefully transferred the locations of the holes from the headlight cover. 
I put a straight edge along the bottom holes as a drill guide. Once the holes are drilled, I can fold the wings. Looking at photos of SP's Dash 7 units, the wings appear to be parallel to each other. The mounting plate is now almost finished. I won't lie, this wasn't an easy part to make. It took me three tries to get this one right. I'm going to set the good one aside for the moment and go back to working on the box. I'll start the box by cutting three pieces of the HO scale 4x12 styrene to quarter inch lengths. I'm actually cutting these slightly too long so I can sand them later. I'll eventually need four pieces, but I'm starting with three. More on that in a moment. I'm using liquid styrene cement to laminate the pieces together. The rear end of the B30-7 hood is angled, not flat, so I'll need to cut and file my box to fit. I'm using a pencil mark where the contours of the body bend. I can use those marks as a guide while cutting and filing my part. I had an idea to tape some sandpaper to the rear of the shell and use that to help get the final contour just right. I've used some CA glue to attach the emergency light mounting plate to the box. Now I'm going to cut pieces from the HO scale 4x12 styrene strip to fill in around the base of the mounting plate. This is a lot more work than just gluing the mounting plate to the top of the box, but I'm hoping that embedding the brass in the plastic will help it be more durable when the model is handled. I've glued the bits of plastic to the top of the box. Once this dries, I'll need to very carefully cut and sand down the excess material. Note that the brass wings extend a little farther forward than they need to. I can trim those down too, though it would have been better to make them a little shorter in the first place. At this point, it's important to go slowly. I don't want to ruin the part by removing too much material and have to start over. Now that the part is cut down to size, I'll use some squadron green putty to fill any remaining seams between the layers of plastic that make up the box. I generally like to let the putty dry overnight before sanding it. I'm using an improvised sanding block made from a piece of 400 grit paper wrapped around a scrap piece of plastic. To make sure everything is square, I'm using a Northwest Shortline True Sander for the final sanding. I use some double-sided tape to stick a piece of 400 grit paper to the metal sanding block. I'm only making a few slow passes, checking as I go until everything is square. Next, I'll open up a bottle of paint. I'm using Tester's Model Master Engine Black, but the color isn't really important. I'll brush a little paint on the surfaces that I puttied. When the paint is dry, I hold it up to the light and check to see if I can still see any seams between the laminated layers. In this particular case, I'm mostly concerned about the sides of the box. It looks pretty good. If I could still see any seams, I'd have to putty them again. I've carefully sanded off most of the test paint. As I mentioned earlier, I'm using a cover plate from BLMA Part 4551. As I'm working on this program, these are still available on the Atlas website. I'm using a plastic tool to hold the part down while I apply some liquid styrene cement. Even though the cover plate is brass, the plastic underneath will soften enough to make it adhere. I wouldn't hold it using my fingers as there's a chance that capillary action might make the glue leak out where my skin is in contact with the part. The cover plate also hides the seams on the back of the box. The light cluster is now finished. Now it's time to start detailing the rear of the long hood. For the blanked out number boards, I'm using Details West Part 249. These are white metal castings. They're intended for the front of GE locomotives, but are very close to what should be on the back of my engine. For the rear headlight casting, I'm using Detail Associates Part 1003, which is a styrene casting. I'll use the class light covers from the same BLMA Part 4551 I used for the oscillating light cover. The headlight casting needs to have the excess plastic trimmed off the ends. My number board castings are pretty clean, so I'll just give them a light filing. They have indentations on the back that will fit inside the number board slots in the shell. The important thing is to glue all these parts in the right places. Since the number boards fit into existing holes in the shell, I'll start with those. The instructions say that the tab should be to the center, but prototype photos show that they should be on the outside on the rear of SP's-7 units. This is what the number boards look like test fit to the model. I'm checking to make sure that they align with each other. Also, I don't want to cover up the grab iron holes with the tabs on the ends. I'll glue them from the inside using CA. There's a little gap on the inside of each number board where part of the hole is still visible. I'll fill this from the inside using some canopy glue. You could also use white glue. There's no need to sand this as it's very tiny and in a place where it will be hard to see anyway. Now is a good time to redrill the grab iron holes with the number 78 drill bit. I'll also drill holes under the grab iron holes where I sanded off the bolt detail while working on the rear of the shell. To replace the bolt detail, I'll use Titchy 8016 nut bolt washer castings. I'll cut these at an angle to leave a point on the stem. This makes them easier to put in the holes. I'm not doing it on camera because all you'll see is my hand, but it's better to hold the castings as you cut them so that they don't go flying away. 
Once I'm done, I'll grab them from my cutting board with a piece of tape so I don't lose them. It turns out that the original number 78 holes that I drilled for the nut bolt washer castings are too small, so I'm using a number 76 bit to ream them out. I'm using some fine pointed tweezers to insert the castings. In case you haven't seen them, you can usually find tweezers like this where they sell cosmetics. Note that I've only replaced the detail that I sanded off. You could do all of them, but I've decided not to on my model. I'm using Titchy 3015 drop style grab irons. Before I install them, I like to square up the ends with some needle nose pliers. I also cut the stems shorter. I'll insert the grab irons into the holes with needle nose pliers. Some 040 styrene strip will work well to help space the grab irons from the hood. The goal is to make them all uniform. I'll glue the grab irons from the inside using CA. Don't do this with the spacer in place as if any glue seeps through the holes it can make a mess on the outside of the model. Looking at photos, the top of the headlight casting should be about even with the tops of the number boards. Once I have it positioned, I'll tack it in place with some liquid styrene cement. I can still make subtle adjustments to the position before the glue dries. When I'm satisfied that it's centered and straight up and down, I'll glue it again. Note that I'm not concerned about lining up the new headlight casting with the original headlight holes. I'll do the same thing with the light cluster assembly. The bottom of the box should be slightly above the top of the headlight casting. It should also be centered and straight. I like to check it from a variety of angles before gluing it permanently. Next, I'll laminate another block of styrene for more 040 strips. Once this is dry, I'll glue it in place behind the headlight inside the shell. Now I can use a number 67 drill bit to drill through the center of each headlight. The styrene block inside the shell will act as a support for the fiber optics that I'll use to light the headlights later. I glued on the class light covers with liquid styrene cement. The tops of these should be about even with the top of the access door. The rear of the B30-7 long hood is now finished and I think it turned out pretty good. I'll set this one aside for now. Since the next sequence of steps is mostly the same for both SD45Rs, I'm only going to show my work on 7482, except when there's something different to show on 7479. Thankfully for the SD45Rs, I don't need to fabricate a custom light bracket. Detail Associates makes one, part 1021. It comes with two, enough to do both units. The part fits the shell perfectly. I'll tack glue it first with some liquid styrene cement. The main thing here is to make sure that it's straight in all directions. Once I'm satisfied with the fit, I'll glue it permanently. Just like I did with the B30-7, I'll drill holes for nut bolt washer castings with a number 78 drill bit first, followed by a number 76 bit. I like to use the smaller drill bit first because it seems easier to control where the hole goes. Again, I'm only putting castings where the original detail was sanded off. The Proto 2000 shell doesn't have bolt detail built in, so I'm putting nut bolt washer castings on all of the grab irons except the bottom one, as there isn't room between the grab iron holes and the access door hinges. You might notice that I removed most of the test paint from the rear of 7479. The glue will adhere better without the paint in the way. I'm using BLMA part 4551 again for the class light covers. For this model, I want the larger round ones. There are several styles. I need the ones without gaskets and with two screw heads in them. Before I glue them on, I'll open up the original class light locations with the drill. I'm using my number 67 drill again since it's already on my workbench, but anything smaller than the class light cover would work. The holes will help me position the covers. I've tack glued them in place with liquid styrene cement. Once I've adjusted them to final position and made sure everything looks straight, I can glue them permanently. Getting a small amount of this type of glue on the outside of the model is usually okay as long as it's not disturbed before it dries. The screw heads should be oriented horizontally. The holes I drilled also let me put a little CA on the class light covers from the inside. Just a little extra insurance. Unfortunately, my rear photo of 7479 is too dark and grainy to make out much detail. Not all SD45Rs had the same style of class light covers. The only good rear photos I found of this unit were from 2011 after the unit had been rebuilt again and in CEFX leasing paint and one from 1985 when the class lights were still in place. I'm going to make an assumption that they didn't bother changing the class light blanks when they repainted the engine, so I'm going to use the round ones with gaskets that are in the CEFX photo. 
I'm using the same Titchy grab irons on the SD45R as applied using the same techniques as on the B30-7. The only difference is that I use thick CA to glue these from the inside. It has more viscosity and doesn't run all over the place the way the thinner glue can, so it's a little easier to control where it ends up. In hindsight, it would have been better to use this on the B30-7. I've glued the rear headlight casting in place using liquid styrene cement. After looking at my photos of 7482, I've decided that the KV model's light covers are the closest to what was on the real engine. Stainless steel is a little harder to cut than brass. I'm using the thick part of my X-Acto blade. A few passes with a file will clean up the edges. I use liquid styrene cement to glue the covers to the light bracket. The emergency light cover should have one bolt on the top and two on the bottom. The oscillating light cover has four bolts, two on each end. Unfortunately, SP didn't have a single way of plating over its light clusters either, and in this case my photo of 7479 as a CEFX unit is no help because the rear light bracket was modified. I'm going to make another assumption and use the same covers I used on 7482. Now I'll laminate another block of styrene from 040 strips. After cutting it down a little to fit, I'll glue it inside the model using liquid styrene cement. Once the glue dries, I can drill holes for fiber optics using a number 67 drill bit. It's important to make sure the drill goes through straight. I like to look at the locomotive from the side and the top while drilling to make sure that it's aligned properly. I'll do the same thing for 7479, only I won't need to put in a styrene block. The number board insert that's already glued inside the model will serve the same purpose. I now have 7787, 7482, and 7479 at more or less the same level of completion, and I feel like I've made some good progress. These look like SP engines now, at least from the back. There's still a lot to do, but I'll have to wait for the next episode. One thing I've learned while building models is that it's a lot easier to make changes while the model is still being built than it is to go back and redo something after it's finished. So if something bothers me, like the brake wheel recess on 7482, it's better to fix it now. It's a lot easier to make changes or corrections before the model is painted. If you don't have drawings or actual measurements of something, dimensions can often be estimated. One way is to use details of known size as a reference, like I did using the cover plate to get the width of the light cluster box for the B30-7. The placement of features on the model can also be good reference points. I used the number boards on the rear of 7787 to determine where to mount the headlight casting. Worst case, you can make some cautious assumptions about size. In the absence of any other references, I sometimes assume that people will usually build things to some easily measured dimension rather than some weird fraction. Sometimes using N-scale feet or real inches is more convenient than always using an HO scale ruler. So long as the part ends up the right size, it's fine. Whichever part of the ruler works best for a particular job, use it. I'm pretty happy with the progress that I made in this episode. The locomotives are really starting to take shape and they're starting to look like SP engines. I'm anxious to continue the project, so please stay tuned for the next episode.